you know, I was I was in a meeting a couple of months ago, and a brand new employee was hired, and and I was just I was so impressed with this individual willing to ask this question, and I was like, so what does a what does a vice president actually do? It's lunchtime, and this is Brad Anderson's lunch break. Microsoft's campus hosts some of the smartest people I know of on a pretty regular basis. You never know who might be paying a visit on any given day. So while they're here, I make it a point to meet up for lunch. So one thing about you that's, that's, that's interesting, you are the first CIO from GE, or at GE, that comes from a technology background. Yes. Isn't that, is that a turning point? It, it absolutely is. You know, it's it's great on one respect that this recognition that technology, specifically information technology, is key to the business. At the same time, it's frightening because I don't want to screw it up for everybody else. I take a look at even like our leadership here. I take a look at Satya as an example. I mean, he's an engineer at heart. Yeah. And when we go have briefings and we update, you know, Satya, I mean, we're in the code, we're in the telemetry. It's remarkable yeah. how deep he's into the details. I don't know how you can go into a business meeting and tell somebody that they should be using technology to do something differently when you can't demonstrate it yourself. No, I agree. You got to be in the details. You got to be hands on. You know, if you're if you're gonna, if you're going to have an impact, if you're going to be a great leader, you got to be in the details. Have to be. Is your Tesla self-driving? It is. So what's that like to drive? It just it's awesome. It's uh, I do it every day you know, on the way to work and on the way home. Oh my yeah. gosh, I've never done it before. Yeah. But is it a freak out the first time? It does. I mean, the first few times you're like, no, nah, do I really trust this thing? And you're, you know, it's you're coming around a corner at 70 miles an hour, and you're like, and there's cars next to you. Uh, do I really? Am I putting my life in you know crazy wow. hands here? But after a while, when you, you know, you, you're, you're cautious you're, with it, then you start to figure out. No, this thing really, yeah. Productivity, the research says, has been beginning to flatten. Yeah. So how do we how do we get it to surge again? What do we have to do to make people to accelerate the productivity? Yeah. Let's let's look at the data. Right, 1990 to 2010, industrial productivity was around four percent year over year. For the last five years, it's been one percent. And if you really look at it, it's even declining further. Correct. So we're focused there. I really believe it's around the machines. No one has really harnessed data coming off of you know, machines in a plant, or looked at how you create um, new analytics based on all the data you already have. So I think if you can start to harness the machine data, combine it with your enterprise data, that's where I believe it's gonna come from. You and I get to spend a, a lot of time with, with leaders from around the world. And really, a common conversation is, listen, you've got a fantastic cloud, Amazon's got a fantastic cloud. Why should I go with Azure? Yeah, so there's a whole bunch of reasons. One of them, I think, is the, our leadership in terms of global coverage. So we're operating now in 30 regions. We've announced 34 regions and that we've got a whole bunch of other regions under development. So we've got way more than Amazon does. Yeah, actually exactly. more than double. We have more than Amazon and, and Google combined. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. And the reason that's important to so many customers is, is uh, for a variety of reasons actually. One is they've got data that's in a particular location and they've got customers that are accessing that data, meaning themselves or third parties, and they want those customers to have close access to the it's data. It's a proximity. So it's a proximity latency thing. Another big key consideration is regulatory or tax reasons or cultural reasons around where the data has to reside within certain geopolitical boundaries, even yeah. down to the country level. And we ha even have extreme cases where they don't actually want anybody from outside the, the country operating that data yeah, center. Yeah, you know, if you roll forward, these data sovereignty rules and these rules and regulations, they're gonna, they're gonna be more, not less. Exactly, I mean, we're seeing this trend, right, as, as countries get more concerned about where their data is and how it's being handled, and uh, this trend towards, hey, I need data under my control. Yeah, so the reason why we're spending, you know, I mean, billions of dollars every year and getting the broadest footprint is to be able to help organizations with those rules or with those, those laws. Yeah, but we also got an awesome story when it comes to the places where the public cloud might not be able to reach for the foreseeable future or maybe ever. Oh, and maybe really? in scenarios where the public cloud just can't even address sure. those needs, where you still wish, hey, I want the public cloud model, the cloud model, this application Utility model, and, everything, yeah. and I want to be able to take stuff and have the same way that I operate and develop whether, regardless of where the application is going to run, in one of these places or in the public cloud. And the story we've got for that is called Azure Stack. That's right. It's basically take Azure and run it in your own data centers. And that I see is a huge differentiator for us because a developer can go develop an application and take advantage of all of the APIs and build a modern cloud app. 
but then if for some reason they need to run it in their data centers rather than yeah. ours, they have that flexibility. Exactly. Amazon, and if you build an app up there, you're, you're it's locked the, in. It's there, right? Yep. Yep. Unless you go to some lower level common denominator like a container technology, but then you're missing out on PaaS and the overall application model. Further, you're missing out on the ecosystem because oh, as right. we're building Azure, there's a partner ecosystem developing solutions and applications. And with Azure Stack, that ecosystem can target compatibility across the two. So when you buy Azure Stack, you're buying more than just compatibility for your own apps, but also into this ecosystem that's gonna be delivering solutions that you can deploy in your own data centers. And then also from uh, unlocking business in terms of regulations, we're the leader right now in terms of certifications. So things right. like uh, national certifications, national standards like FedRAMP in the United States, or ISO standards, which are international, to vertical standards like PCI, HIPAA. We've got over 45, and the number continues to grow. We've become a certification machine, and a lot of businesses just can't move their data into a cloud without those kinds of certifications, because sure. their regulators or their risk officers are demanding that they adhere to these kinds of policies. Next time on Brad Anderson's Lunch Break. We spent about four months uh, traveling around the world, looking at uh, little startup companies, looking at other technology and industrial companies. Uh, and we came back and we said, it's the space, it's, it's the digital world. You know, so one of the things I, I've, I've read about you, you talk about talent retention and how important it is to retain talent. What do you look for in terms of, you know, as you build out your team, just the importance of diversity.